Good morning, everyone. What a week this has been. Thank you so much to all of you for joining in the Taking Nature Black Conference. I don't know about you, but my mind is full and my heart is full and I have had such a great week. And I appreciate you being here. I'm Lisa Alexander. I'm the director of the Audubon Naturalist Society. And um, I wanted to tell you a little story about the Audubon Naturalist Society and about its history and then tell you a little bit about what we're grappling with and ask for us to have as best we can in this two-dimensional environment, a conversation about what Audubon Natural Society might think about and what it might do next. So here's the story of the history of the Audubon Naturalist Society. Around the 1890s, there was a lot of action going on in the bird world, mostly bad for birds. Uh, fashion was focused on feathers and nests and eggs and even entire birds on women's hats. And as a result, birds were being slaughtered in enormous numbers to feed both the fashion industry and the food industry. And around the country, quite a few women were inspired to set up what they called at the time Audubon Societies. And these Audubon societies, which sprung up all over the country, were designed specifically to advocate for conservation of our wonderful birds. Um, what I love about Audubon societies is they were a grassroots operation. They were often formed by women and they successfully over the course of time advocated to get the Migratory Bird Treaty Act passed. That law is the most important law that we have in the United States for protecting birds. And despite the Trump administration's terrible recent rule that sought to roll back the Migratory Bird Protection, um, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, these women managed to get that law passed when they didn't even have the right to vote. And that is how our organization, the Audubon Naturalist Society started. Back in 1897, we were called the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia. And we were founded for bird conservation and bird education. And we went into schools to train teachers how to teach their students about birds. We had meetings, we had um, outings, and we were all white. We were 100% white. And then in the 1920s, a bunch of Audubon societies from all around the country decided to confederate. They decided that they would be stronger as a national movement. Well, up and down the East Coast, there were a bunch of Audubon societies like the Audubon Society of the District of Columbia that did not confederate. We were big, we were strong, we had a lot of members, all white members, I'll note, um, and we decided not to confederate. So this is an important turning point in the 1920s in bird conservation history. National Audubon forms on one side, and then around the country, a bunch of Audubon stay independent. You might recognize the names of some of those, Massachusetts Audubon, Connecticut Audubon, Rhode Island Audubon, Maine Audubon, Montana Audubon, Kansas Audubon, all still independent and not a national organization. Well, for Audubon Naturalist Society, we began to evolve and change. Our focus and our interest broadened beyond the birds. We decided that land conservation was a really important aspect of the work we needed to do. And we were able, working in concert with our members and people around the region, all white, I'll add, uh, to conserve the CNO Canal here in the Washington DC region, it was destined to become a highway. And we thought that wasn't such a good idea. We were able to save Huntley Meadows and Dyke Marsh in Virginia from development. We were able to save 10 Mile Creek in Montgomery County, Maryland, which, was the, which is the last best creek in our county and feeds into our emergency drinking water supply. In about the 1960s, we decided that the name Audubon Society of the District of Columbia spoke too much about just the birds. 
So our name was changed and we changed it to Audubon Naturalist Society to reflect the fact that we were about more than just the birds. But the truth is we were still all white. And so we come to today. The modern Audubon Naturalist Society is an Audubon Naturalist Society that embraces inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. It's part of our strategic plan. We call it IDEA, that's our acronym. And the big idea is that for us to protect the environment, to have healthy habitats for people and wildlife, to have environmental justice in our region, our big idea is that everybody has to be at the table. But then we've gotten some bad news. The bad news is the unveiling in um, many publications of the very troubling past of John James Audubon, the man. So some of you may know of John James Audubon. He was a bird artist of remarkable note and his artistry, his beautiful paintings of birds really elevated birds in the collective consciousness of the nation as something worth saving. Um, but John James Audubon, the man was not a good man. He was an owner of enslaved people. He was a declared and published white supremacist. He was a person who collected Native American skulls and skulls of uh, Mexican people that his soldiers had killed in war. And so now today, Audubon Naturalist Society, with our big idea of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, has to grapple with this name. And our board of directors has decided to um, launch what we're calling a name task force to do a deep dive into what does it mean to be named in honor of someone who is not an honorable person. Now, John James Audubon was dead by the time the Audubon societies came along. He was, I think, lifted up because of his bird artistry. But now we must grapple with the fact that he was not a good person and he was a perpetrator of white supremacy. And so we consider now what to do about the name. I think you might've read that I was calling this session of monuments and men. We're seeing lots of changes happening in our region. We're taking down monuments, we're renaming buildings, but I want Audubon Natural Society to avoid changing the name and saying, well, that's that, we're done, and avoiding the work that has to go into recognizing the white supremacist nature of the environmental movement in general, and that includes Audubon Naturalist Society. So to the best of our ability, I'd like this morning in the time that we have to just have a conversation, and I'm gonna ask you some questions, and I'll ask our wonderful um, support team leader, Sarah Nella Linares, our director of virtual programs to help me work through your comments and questions. But my first question to you is, what does the name Audubon mean to you? And Sarah Nella, I'm gonna ask you to help me pick out some examples to read as answers to this question. Yes, right now we are waiting for people to um, type in the chat box. Thank you for doing that. Um, we have Tristan and Chase uh, typing birds. Ellen will like uh, beautiful art associated with ANS. Bernadette associates birds, history, and art. Chris Lancet, learning opportunities. Hi, Chris. Jen Wolf, natural history. Suri Jan, birds and conservation. Lisa, this is very interesting for me to read. I'm just so interested. Um, does anybody have, this is my next question. Oh yes, this is something Natalie has pointed out. I'll point out to you, one of the hallmarks of the way that John James Audubon um, created his beautiful bird art is that he actually killed the birds and then posed them. And I always say that that's why we call a red-bellied woodpecker a red-bellied woodpecker because in life, when the woodpecker is flying around and at your feet or in your trees, you never see its belly. But if you shoot it and lay it down, you see its belly. Faith is noting that it's a segregated approach to nature and birds. 
And I think we've heard so many times today from so many of our speakers that this assumption that people who are non-white do not appreciate, interact with, love, you know, cherish nature is just so wrong-headed and so terrible. So <laughs> I see Dia has already made up her mind. She's like, bruh, this name has got to change. I think what I want to talk with you about is what would be the reasons when I see all these responses that say birds, nature, art, conservation, what would be the reasons that you would most want to change the name? And by the way, I'm gonna save this chat and I'm gonna share it with our name task force. So that's my next question to you. What would be the reasons that you would want to change the name? Oh, I see Richard has a nice comment about Audubon Natural Society evolving. I will tell you that I am not afraid of a name change because we have changed our name in the past to mark that evolution to, um, and I see Jessica saying, because it would respect our enslaved ancestors. I think that's a very important way to think about name change. I like Chris's answer to create a name that represents what a &S aspires to be. That's lovely, that's terrific. So there is a, a note from Josephine, which I appreciate because this is the reality of it, which is that it is very expensive to change your name. Um, and Josephine asked the good question, do I have a number yet? I don't yet. It'll be part of the task force work to assess what does it actually cost. So there are um, kind of two aspects to the cost that I'll describe to you. One is um, the kind of what I would call the physical aspect of changing the name. You, you know, here I am wearing my Audubon t-shirt, all of our letterhead, our gear that we wear in the field, all of that would change. Um, but then there's this other cost, which is we're known in the region for our name, Audubon Naturalist Society. And if we change it, we will lose some of that um, profile. So there's a cost to getting the word out. And that's a cost that could be enormous to really helping our region because we're a regional organization um, understand that we've become something different. I would like to point out uh, Suri Jan's answer. To change the name isn't to disregard the work Audubon has done. It is to remove praising someone just because they did something positive when they've done so much harm. And then Roseanne, thank you Roseanne for being with us through the conference, asks, is ANS planning to change the name or task force to determine whether to do so or not? Lisa, would you like to expand onto that particular point? Yes, so I know that a lot of folks here with us at the conference work for nonprofit organizations. And most of your nonprofit organizations are probably governed by a board of directors, as are we. I like to say that I have 18 bosses and that every year my bosses change when we vote in new board members. But ultimately decision-making power at the level of changing the name falls into the hands of our board of directors. Uh, you've gotten to a chance to hear at least one of our board of uh, directors members on our panels, Alan Spears. Um, and one of the things that they will do is they'll consider the task force's recommendation. So the task force is set up to uh, kind of study all the things that we've been talking about, the costs, the reasons, the um, possible impacts, positive and negative of changing the name. And based on what they learn over the six months that they're gonna work on this project, then they will make a recommendation to the board. But ultimately it will be the board's decision about whether we change the name or not. Uh, one of the things I think that is interesting to note is right now, both uh, National Audubon and all of the other independent Audubons around the country do not have a plan to change their name. They are talking about um, just interpreting the history of the name Audubon, why it came to be and who the man was and not hiding behind that. Um, I was just talking to the head of New Jersey Audubon who, who gave me the idea that we just don't wanna, again, change the name, say work is done. We really have to grapple with this racist history 
of the environmental movement in general. Would you like to address the other side of the coin? Um, many people are experiencing a similar feeling to what Carrie Kovalist communicates. And one of the reasons she was quickly to sign up for this conference was the Audubon name. And she recognized it as a national brand. Uh, would changing the name isolate you from other parts of the Audubon community that aren't changing the names? That's a really good question. I think it's one of the pros and cons the task force will examine. Um, I will tell you that for the 15 years, is it 15, 16 years, I've worked with Audubon Naturalist Society. I've often called our name a double-edged sword because already there's confusion. When I say I work for Audubon Naturalist Society, people often assume I work for a national organization. And one of the reasons that um, all of us at Audubon Natural Society are proud of the work we do is that we focus solely on the DC metro region. And I feel like that laser focus on where we live gives us a lot of opportunity to make positive impact. So while Audubon has gotten me in the door, a lot of places, I then end up having to do a lot of explaining. The other thing I think about with Audubon is it is a brand on so many field guides. So it's, um, it's a it's a challenge to walk away from a name that 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 is that popular. I'll tell you an interesting story from the field because, as you can imagine, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about brand changes. Um, I don't know if you folks are familiar with uh, a group called Elder Hostel. It was formed for seniors to go traveling, primarily in nature, but also lots of cultural uh, travel. And they decided that they wanted to rebrand to attract younger people. And um, they rebranded to a name called Exploritas. And the minute I heard that, I thought, well, who's going to know what on earth that is? And what, who's going to sign up for anything? And sure enough, after changing their name to Exploritas, about a year later, maybe two, they ended up changing their name again to the name Road Scholar. And that for me was a little lesson in how we have to be very careful if we do change our name to what it becomes. Thank you. We have a lot of people that agree with the change in the name. And I would like to highlight um, the, the message communicated by Dia Brown. Um, we have museums, they can go there. I mean, people can go there. And in museum exhibits, for example, and information on the website, you can share the history of the original name and explain the change. And I would like to communicate to our audience that I see that the Q&A section is on fire. So please type your questions there because that is where my attention is going next. Thank you. And I would also say that I, um, I think that we would still be in the fold with independent Audubons. One of the um, hallmarks of Audubon Natural Society is our ability to convene, collaborate, and work in coalition with others. And we have a coalition of the independent Audubon societies. And in fact, we just did a joint action on the Migratory Bird Treaty Act to get that bad Trump rule rolled back. Uh, but we also include in our fold the Delaware Nature Society. They're not named Audubon, but they operate very much the way we do. So I suspect that we would still be able to collaborate effectively and be welcomed with other independent Audubons. Uh, but it is an interesting uh, quandary because there's, a, there's that national notion of the name Audubon. It's all over the country. And so we would, we would step away from that in a new name situation. Okay. Um, since we are 10 minutes to the end of the session, I would like to read to you some of the most popular questions. Okay. Wonderful. So I really like the most popular question right now, and it comes from Kathy Yonking. 
what is your board makeup with regards to diversity? So we have 18 uh, members on our board of directors and seven of those members are people of color. We have, um, we have made a concerted effort to change the board composition over time. And so I feel like we're going in the right direction with that. And that was intentional and it was purposeful. And one of the reasons that I feel proud about our board composition is that the people who are participating on our board who are BIPOC are people who've been part of the work of Audubon Natural Society for quite some time. It's not like we were plucking token folks off the street. We really engaged with communities in our work through these conferences, through the planning that we're doing for the organization. And naturally, those are people who then become the leaders, the people who become the decision makers for the organization. And I think at least one board member is in the room. I think I saw a note from Diane Wood, who is the former head of the National Environmental Education Foundation, who's in the room. Um, <clears throat> and um, there's another organization, Audubon uh, organization from Delaware, um, that thanks you for the shout out uh, to their parallel mission. The next very popular question we have is, can you do the work you aspire to without changing the name, but acknowledging the history of the name? I think that's a really good question. And I think the answer actually lies with you, the folks who are attending this conference. Once you know the history of John James Audubon, does that name create a barrier to participation. Because for me, the number one reason to change the name is if it is standing in the way of the organization really living out our strategic vision of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And if the name is a stop sign for folks, then we need to not have that stop sign. We need to move that out of the way. Thank you, Lisa. To our audience in the Q&A, you can vote up the questions that you like so they I, they appear next as the time moves forward i would be more inclined to those to read those that are on the top thank you for helping us so it's interesting i would just add that um i see a note from paul pisano who is one of our members and he's asking the question about uh, in the chat about actions speaking louder than words I think that's an important point. You know, you have to show up and do the work. And regardless of what your name is, if you're not showing up and you're not doing the work and you're not having the uncomfortable conversations that you need to have, then name change is just window dressing. And we don't want that. Um, another thing that came up when we were having this discussion at the Naturally Latinos conference is that the word society might be just as off-putting because it, smacks of exclusivity. Thank you. Um, is the task force composed of a diverse group of persons who will provide feedback from Suri Jan? Yes, that's a really important aspect of the task force is that it's not just ANS members and ANS board members and ANS staff. It's uh, communities that we hope to serve in the future who may not be actively engaged with ANS at this point. And um, by the way, I'm still recruiting for the task force. So if you would like to, um, Sarah Nella, I think at the end can share my email and then we can, um, you can nominate yourself to join the task force. Thank you, Lisa. The next question is how about naturalist society and just remove Audubon. Ah, so this is where the fun begins, right? What, what, what do we call ourselves then? Uh, we're very excited to think about it. There's part of me that wants to make something still work with the, because our shorthand, our internal shorthand for Audubon Natural Society is ANS. And you might've heard that during this conference. Um, I, I think that'll be a longer process and I definitely wanna hire an expert to help us with that work because 
we could make a misstep like Elder Hostel did and pick a name that doesn't help elevate the principles that we want to convey. And so I appreciate you starting to have fun with the name game. Feel free to put those in the chat. I welcome all the names you can think of or the words that make you think of um, Nature for All, which is one of our uh, big campaigns we call Nature for All. So that's something that also sticks in my mind as maybe a good choice for us because that really embodies the work that we hope to be doing for the next 124 years. Um, I would like to uh, answer this question from Tristan Still. Um, one of the downsides of naming an organization after a person has this uh, effect of the skeletons in their closet. Would you <laughs> recommend no longer naming organizations after individuals? Well, and even birds. I don't know if any of you are birders, but there's a big move afoot in the bird world to change the names of birds who've been named after Confederate generals and owners of enslaved people and even John James Audubon. So I think there's some wisdom in that idea of uh, stepping away from people as the namesake. And Harper would like to know, do participants feel the word society in an organization's name conveys exclusivity? Ah, so Anne has not revealed that she's with Delaware Nature Society. <laughs> so she has the same society problem that I do. Um, how are you on your board assessing whether or not it is a stop sign for audiences you serve and look to serve from Jillian Bell? Thank you, Jillian. That's going to be part of the um, work of the task force is identifying the audiences that we need to be checking with and figuring out what the best um, method for gathering feedback from. And as I mentioned, What's really important is not just the audiences we currently serve, but new audiences that we hope to serve in the future and, and finding some good testing. I'm very lucky in that my director of operations, Amy Ritzko Warren, has a master's degree in market research. So I've got an expert in the house that will help us uh, frame the questions that we need to ask and provide the incentives so that people will answer the questions. Um, because that data gathering will be an important point in the task force decision-making as we go forward. Thank you, Lisa. With one minute remaining, this would be your last question. The time and effort put into this name change is vital to your system sustainability. If done correctly, it could help guide so many institutions struggling with this line of truth, which is joke of truth. Would you say a couple of last words regarding that? I will be a little bit, um, what, what am I going to say, a little bit uh, lighthearted because it is Saturday. And I will say that when you head an organization that's 124 years old, one of your biggest jobs is to not screw it up, right? Like it's been around for 124 years, don't screw it up. And so if we do approach the name change, I think we have to really focus on getting it right. Because if we were to make a misstep that would unravel so much of the good work that the organization has been able to do over the 124 years, that would just be the worst outcome. So we're gonna take this slowly and we're gonna take it seriously. And it might be you know, years before the outcome of all this work is, is done. But I feel confident that with smart, thoughtful people in the room on the task force providing feedback that we will come to the right answer for the organization. And I just want to thank, I thought maybe there'd be like 15 people in this uh, panel session. So I want to thank everyone for, you know, getting into it with me. This is really important work for Audubon Natural Society. And I so appreciate your questions and your feedback and your participation in Taking Nature Black. So thank you for being with us today. Thanks, everybody. Have a good morning.